attacked around 9.30 p.m. on Easter Sunday in 1975. Jimmy Rupert calmly informed the police operator of a shooting. Upon arrival, the first officer found no apparent signs of trouble at the small white house in Hamilton, Ohio, except for Jimmy waiting for him at the front door as the officer approached. He could see two small bodies on the living room floor, positioned behind Jimmy, without uttering a word. Jimmy watched as the officer called for backup and then stepped aside to let him in. Tragically, five children were discovered deceased on the living room floor, with the youngest lying at the foot of the couch in Jimmy's outstretched right hand. The devastating scene in the living room was made even more heart-wrenching by the sight of the youngest child, still clutching his chocolate Easter egg at only four years old. However, this was only the beginning of the horror that awaited in the kitchen, where six more family members were found dead. Despite the cramped conditions in the small house, the number of bodies made it nearly impossible to move around. Jimmy had committed the heinous act of murdering his entire family that day, including his mother, older brother, brother's wife, and their eight children, with the youngest also only being four years old. Each victim had been shot twice, once in the head and once in the chest. Jimmy later confessed that it took him less than 10 minutes to kill all 11 people. After the massacre, he changed his clothes and waited for three hours before finally calling the police. In an interview with the Cincinnati Post in 1975, as reported by WCPO.com, the prosecutor vividly described the scene at the Rupert House as carnage, stating that the situation was so dire that one had to tread carefully in the basement to avoid blood seeping through the floorboards and dripping on you. Even today, the blood-stained floorboards in the basement serve as a chilling reminder of the brutal events that transpired. Initially, there was no apparent reason for Jimmy's violent outburst. He was known as a solitary individual who preferred books to socializing. Although intelligent, he lacked direction in life, and at the time of the massacre, he was just two weeks shy of his 41st birthday, with no job, little money, and living with his mother. Jimmy's older brother, Leonard, was the family's shining star. He excelled academically, earning a degree in engineering and landing a high-paying job. He even married Jimmy's former girlfriend, and together they had eight children. In stark contrast, Jimmy flunked out of college after just two years, struggled to hold down a job, and lost what little savings he had during the stock market crash of 1973. By 1975, his only sources of joy seemed to be drinking and practicing target shooting with his four firearms. Unfortunately, his childhood was far from idyllic. He suffered from illness as a child and was arrested at a young age. As an adult, he stood at just 5 foot 6 and weighed a mere 135 pounds. Growing up, his mother frequently reminded him that she had wished for a daughter instead, and his father was no better. Jimmy's father had tormented him relentlessly until his death when Jimmy was 12 years old. From then on, his older brother took up the mantle of abuse, beginning when Jimmy was just 16. Eventually, Jimmy could take no more. He attempted suicide by hanging himself with a bedsheet, but was unsuccessful. After this, he spiraled further into mental illness, his paranoia grew, and he became convinced that his mother and brother were conspiring against him. He believed that his brother was tampering with his old Volkswagen car, and that they were trying to ruin his reputation by falsely accusing him of being a communist and a homosexual. He claimed that the FBI was tapping his phones, both at home and at his favorite bar, the 19th Hole. Just a month before the Easter Massacre, Jimmy purchased additional bullets and silencers. On March 29, 1975, the day before the the massacre, a witness reported seeing him practicing his aim with tin cans near the river. Subsequently, he went to his usual haunt, the 19th hole, and began venting about his mother to the bartender as he did most nights. His mother was trying to kick him out because he didn't have a job, and he vowed to take action against her. According to the bartender, he left around 11 p.m. but returned later. When she inquired if he had resolved the issue, he replied that he had not and continued drinking until the bar closed at 2.30 a.m. the following day. On Easter, his brother, sister-in-law, and their eight children came over to their mother's house for a family gathering. Everything appeared to be normal even with Jimmy in his room upstairs, which was typical. Downstairs was filled with joyous commotion, typical of a large family gathering, except louder because of the house's small size. The house was only about a thousand square feet, with two bedrooms upstairs and a living room and kitchen downstairs. At 4.30 that afternoon, the children had just finished their Easter egg hunt in the yard, while their grandmother was making sloppy joes in the kitchen, since the family had already had a formal dinner at their other grandparents' house after church. Around five o'clock, 
Jimmy appeared downstairs. He greeted his family and with what he later described as a mocking smile, his brother asked him how his Volkswagen was doing. This simple question confirmed every paranoid thought in Jimmy's mind. He turned and went back upstairs. An hour later, he returned carrying his three shotguns and a rifle. Starting in the kitchen, Jimmy began his massacre by shooting his brother Leonard, followed by Leonard's wife, his mother Charity, and three of the children, Michael, Thomas, and Carol, age 16, 15, and 13 respectively. He left his rifle against the fridge and picked up another gun. Heading to the living room, his 17-year-old nephew, Leonard Jr., tried to intervene but was unsuccessful. Jimmy then proceeded to sit on the couch and systematically murder the remaining four kids, Anne, David, Teresa, and Little John, age 12, 11, and 9. After their bodies lay on the floor, he walked around the house and shot each victim again to confirm their deaths. The prosecutor believed he was clinically insane but also cunning. There was a substantial amount of money, roughly $300,000 from life insurance and investments that would go to him if he was found not guilty, even by reason of insanity. Some wondered if he had planned the massacre to inherit the family's wealth. His first trial ended in a mistrial, and in the second trial, he pleaded guilty by reason of insanity and was convicted of all 11 counts of murder. He was given a life sentence. However, his story did not end there. In the third trial, mental health professionals from both the defense and prosecution debated his mental state. In 1982, Jimmy was found guilty of two counts of first-degree murder for killing his mother and brother. However, he was deemed not guilty by reason of insanity for the other nine family members he shot. Despite being denied parole, three times, he is still alive and serving two life sentences at the Franklin Medical Center in Columbus, Ohio. Jimmy's next parole hearing is scheduled for 2025, when he will be 91 years old. Today, the Rupert family massacre remains one of the deadliest shootings to occur inside a private residence in the United States, and Jimmy's story continues to captivate and shock people. The story of James Rupert is both fascinating and disturbing. The book The Ohio State Murders provides a detailed and gripping account of Rupert's life and crimes, painting a vivid portrait of a troubled individual who was capable of unspeakable acts of violence. What struck me most about Rupert's story was the sheer brutality of his crimes, the fact that he was able to murder his entire family including his parents, brother, and sister-in-law, is truly horrifying. But what makes his story even more unsettling is the fact that he was able to continue killing for years without getting caught. The book does an excellent job of exploring the psychology behind Rupert's actions, delving into his troubled childhood, his strained relationships with his family members, and his descent into mental illness. It is a sobering reminder of the devastating impact that mental illness can have on individuals and those around them. What is perhaps most disturbing about Rupert's story is the fact that he was able to manipulate the legal system and evade the death penalty. Despite overwhelming evidence against him, he was able to secure a life sentence instead, which allowed him to live out the rest of his days in prison. Overall, The Ohio State Murders is a well-written and thoroughly researched book that provides a thought-provoking and nuanced account of James Ruppert's life and crimes. While the subject matter is undoubtedly disturbing, the book is an important reminder of the need for better mental health resources and the importance of taking warning signs seriously. In conclusion, the Ohio State Murders is a powerful and haunting book that leaves a lasting impression on the reader. Rupert's story is a cautionary tale about the dangers of mental illness and the devastating impact that violence can have on families and communities. It is a must-read for anyone interested in true crime or the workings of the justice system. That concludes our recap. Thank you for spending your time with me today. If you enjoy getting all the latest crime news in half the time, we would greatly appreciate it if you hit the like and subscribe buttons. And don't forget to turn on the notification bell to ensure that you never miss an episode. Take care, and we hope to see you back here soon.